We'll have our scripture reading and then our sermon. Good evening. Scripture reading today, or we'll be coming from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, and I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Again, that's Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How deep the Father's love for us. What a thought to consider. When I started preparing for the lesson tonight and figuring out what I want to talk about and ultimately decided on this topic, I pretty quickly realized that I was in over my head because there's no possible way that we can talk about and fully cover the magnitude, the power, or the depth of God's love. It's just not possible. We could have every sermon, every Sunday morning, and every Sunday night for the next year and really still be just scratching the surface. And one could pretty easily make the argument that the entirety of the Bible is about God's love from the very beginnings in Genesis to the very last words in Revelation. Yet at the same time, we could also sum it up in in these three short words, God is love. I believe that this concept of God's love and the concept of trying to understand God's love is quite possibly the most important thing that any of us could ever try to wrap our minds around. Of course, we know that it's not really possible to fully comprehend, to fully grasp, to fully understand the concept of his love, but what better thought for us to consider tonight and meditate on tonight for the few short moments that we have. So we're going to break tonight's lesson up into three different parts. Part number one is God loved us first. Part number two is God loves us in spite of ourselves. And then finally, part number three, what do we do with that love? God loved us first. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On the first day of this planet's existence, God also created light, and then he separated that light from darkness. And the next four days, God would go on to create uh, the rest of the world. He separated the land and the sea. He created the plants and the vegetation. He made the sun, moon, and stars, the fish of the sea, the the birds of the air. And on that sixth day, God created the beasts of the earth, but he also created man. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 as we kind of open the lesson. Some verses that we're all familiar with that we've all read many times. Genesis chapter 1, reading the account of the sixth day of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, it says this, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made. And behold, it was very good. I don't think we can talk about how God loved us first without talking about creation. From the very beginning, it's evident that God loved man because after all, he made mankind in his own image. I saw a picture of one of Virginia's cousins the other day uh, when she, her cousin, was about a two-year-old or three-year-old toddler. And I saw the image, I instantly did a double take because the image of her cousin as a two or three year old toddler looks literally exactly like her cousin's uh, child who was about the same age. And if you were to hold up a picture of her cousin at the same age and her cousin now or a picture of her cousin now uh, or her cousin's child, they would look almost identical. You'd hardly be able to tell them apart. 
We are made in God's image, but not in the, in the way that I just as- described in that kind of example, uh, where if you were to hold up a picture of us and a picture of God, if you were even able to do that, we don't look exactly like that. No, we're made in God's image in that we share in a part of his likeness. We are in the likeness of God in that we have a spirit or a soul. Also notice in verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1, the very end, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In the previous 30 verses about creation, it's interesting because God calls his creation, quote, good seven times. But in verse 31, the scripture says it was very good. Yes, God had made everything. His creation is now complete. God did not create an atmosphere of evil with different snares to try to trip us and trap us and get us to do something wrong, but instead God created the earth and everything in it to be a blessing for us. He provided plants, he provided animals, he provided kind of an infrastructure or a system of things to replenish itself where uh, plants can can do that, animals can do that, uh, humans can do that as well. We have uh, the oxygen that we take from the plants and so on and so forth. God created all these things to work together for us as a blessing to us, including meeting our own needs, things like food and water. In Genesis chapter 2, Uh, you'll recall that there's a more specific account of God's making of a woman. In Genesis chapter 1, as we just read, God created man and woman on the sixth day, but in Genesis chapter 2, it gives a little bit more specifics there. Genesis chapter 2, picking up in verses 18 through 20, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper comparable to him. There was not a helper suitable for him. There was not a helper compatible for him. God saw the need of a companion for Adam, and he fulfilled and satisfied that need. He truly cares for us. God has a habit of doing that, doesn't he? He has a habit of seeing a need that we may have and fulfilling that need or satisfying that need without us even really realizing the fact that we need that thing and without uh, being able to, or without going to God to ask for those things. We read that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. And you can think about things in your own life, right? Just as I can think about things in my life that God has provided for me on a daily basis um, or even the bigger things where Uh, Again, I didn't know that I needed a thing or know that I uh, needed to have something, yet God still provided it for me. God cares for me. He cares for you. Another impressive aspect of God's love is that he gives us direct contact to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, the creator of this universe, God himself, allows little old me and little old you to talk to him anytime we want, anytime we need, and what a privilege that is. Even thinking about other situations in life, that doesn't happen, right? I can think about my own life and think about work, and there's times when I need to get in contact with my boss, and it is almost impossible to get in contact with her. She's got meetings scheduled from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, try to message her, and, and maybe she's just got other stuff going on, other, other priorities, and sometimes it feels like I need to schedule a meeting about a month in advance just to schedule some time to talk to her for a few minutes. Yet again, we can talk to the Almighty God himself anytime we want. He is never too busy. Why? Because he loves us. The title of the lesson tonight is How Deep the Father's Love. So we obviously can't talk about that topic without emphasizing those last two words, the Father's love. A few months ago, we had uh, one of our brothers, Mark Reynolds, come and present a series of lessons to us around the Men's, Men's Day Fellowship. And he taught on this topic about God being our father, about the family of God. And if you didn't have a chance to to, uh, listen to his sermons, I definitely recommend you go back and and listen to him online. But uh, he talked a lot about this aspect of of calling God our father. And Jesus himself preached and taught this type of thinking over and over again. And in just the four gospel accounts, Jesus refers to God as father some 165 times. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is giving what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, and in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, And when you prayed, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, 
when you pray, go into your room and you and when you have the door, and when you have your door, when you have shut your door, excuse me, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they'll be heard with their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And as Jesus gave the example of prayer, he begins it with, Our Father, who art in heaven. Jesus says, Our Father. In the 20th chapter of the book of John, Jesus, after he's resurrected from the dead, he speaks to Mary and he says this. He says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father. As Christians, we rejoice that God is our Father. And for everyone else, God desperately wants to have this type of relationship with you. He desperately wants you to be able to call him your Father. Scripture teaches us that there are several things we need to do in order to have this type of relationship with God, to be in his family, to be able to call him our Father. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and 27 says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. In John chapter 3, Nicode Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless he be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And in Romans chapter 6 and Colossians chapter 2, among many other passages, they teach us that in baptism our old self is dead no longer, and we're raised up out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life as a new creature. See, we're dead, we're reborn into the family of God. We're spiritually born again and into his family. And how amazing it is that God desires this type of relationship with us, that God loves us as a father, the perfect father loves his children. God loved us first. God loves us in spite of ourselves. Going back to Genesis chapter 1 in creation, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, remember in verse 31, it says, God saw what he had made, and it was very good. Genesis chapter 2, again, gives more details and specifics about what happened. And in chapter 3, we don't know exactly how long has taken place, what the time frame is, but at least to me, it appears that it's not a very long time. Who knows how long it is exactly, but again, it appears to not be very long. And there in Genesis chapter 3, we messed it up. Adam and Eve sinned against God. Yes, it was Adam and Eve who sinned in Genesis chapter 3, but today we're all guilty of that same charge. In Genesis 3, you remember that Satan in the form of a serpent deceives Eve. He lies to her and tells her that she won't die if she eats the, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He goes on to say that the reason God doesn't want her to eat of that, that fruit is because her eyes will be open and she'll be like God. So Eve gives them to that temptation in front of her and also gave some of that fruit to Adam, and thus they both sinned. So God confronts Adam and Eve, and he asks them a question. He asks them, what is this that you have done, knowing fully that they have disobeyed his commands? He knew exactly what they had done, yet he still asked the question. God then gives out a punishment to Adam and Eve. He tells Eve that because of this, the pains of childbearing are going to be greatly increased, and that the husband will rule over her or over women. God tells Adam that the ground is cursed because of him, and that he would face great difficulties in maintaining the plants of the field because of what he did. But God also does something else. He foretells of the coming deliverance that he would bring. The first prophecy is given there in, Gen in uh, Genesis chapter 3 about Jesus saying that he would be the one to crush Satan. See, in spite of Adam and Eve's disobedience, God's love is shown about by bringing of a deliverer. Even though Adam and Eve were the ones who broke God's commands, God still loved them. We see this time and time again throughout Scripture. And in the Old Testament, we read several examples of that. Maybe the most obvious is about the Israelites and how they continually sinned against God. They continually turned their backs on God, and yet God continued to restore them when they repented. The book of Judges is maybe the prime example of that. So turn with me to, to the book of Judges. Now let's read a few verses to kind of put things in context. In the book of Judges, again, we see this pattern happen over and over and over again. And in Judges chapter 3, verse 7, it says this. 
the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. And then verse 8, the anger of the Lord burned against God, or burned against Israel, excuse me. So he sold them into the hands of their enemies. Look down a few verses after that uh, to verse uh, 12, or excuse me, um, lost my place here. Um, verse 9, excuse me, there you go. Uh, but when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer. Israel sinned against God, and yet when they cried out to God, he gave them a deliverer. Same example happens a few verses down in, in verse 12 of chapter 3. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. And verse 15, again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Yes, this happens time and time again. Chapter 6 starts the exact same way. Again, it, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and when they cried out to the Lord, he sent them a deliverer. Israel disobeyed multiple times. They worshipped other gods, they served Baal, they turned their back on God, and they knew that when they did that, they were going to face hardships. They knew when they cried out to God and he sent them a deliverer, they would face times of peace, yet they continually disobeyed God. But again, when they cried out, he sent about their deliverance. But we know the book of Judges doesn't turn out so well for the Israelites. We know how it turns out. Eventually, the Israelites get to the point where they no longer seek God. They continue to go down the path of their own thinking, what they think is right, and turn away from the Lord. And the last verse of the book of Judges says, in pretty short words to sum everything up, everyone did as he saw fit. The Israelites would reach a point where they would no longer have a deliverer to get them out of their physical oppression, their physical circumstances, because their sins separated them from God and they would not turn back to him. The situation of the Israelites is truly disappointing, but we today... Even people in this room, we can't say that we're not guilty of the same thing, can we? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 says, If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. So there um, we read in those two verses that, again, all of us have sinned. Those of us who are of the, occasion, the age of accountability have all sinned against God. We've all separated ourselves from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, But your sins have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Similar to Adam and Eve, similar to the Israelites and everyone else in this world, we need a deliverer. We need a savior to intercede on our behalf. And God in his marvelous mercy and love once again sent us exactly what we needed. John 3 verse 16 says, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14 says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. But this is not some spur-of-the-moment decision that God made. No, God knew when he created Adam and Eve that they would sin against him. God knew that by giving us all free will, the ability to choose between right and wrong, that we at some point would sin against him. We would separate ourselves from God. So because of his great love for us, he purposed a plan even from the beginning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, in speaking about Christ, who was foreknown indeed before the foundations of the world, but was manifested at the end of times for your sake. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God unto you by mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, even as ye yourselves know, him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye by the hand of the lawless men did crucify and slay. 
Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 says, and he, that is Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God loved us from the beginning, and he loved us in spite of knowing that our sin would separate us from him. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us first. So what do we do with this love of God? Maybe getting a, a little bit better understanding of his love and how he loves us as a father, desires that relationship with us, how he loved us first and in spite of ourselves. What do we do with this deep love that the Father has poured out upon us? Well, it's simple. We love back. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3 to figure out how we can love back. What do we need to do to love back? There's two different ways that are mentioned in 1 John. Two different ways. So we're going to look at way number one first. What do we do with God's love? How do we, how do we return that love? 1 John chapter 3, picking up in verse 11. says, This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Jump down to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. We know what love is because of what Jesus did for us. He laid down his life for us. So now what do we do with that? Look back at verses 17 and 18. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. We love with our actions. We love the world because we recognize that we too were once in a similar state. We were once in a state where we were lost and separated from God because of our sin, but because God sent Jesus to this earth to lay down his life for us, so we also love our neighbors with our actions to show Christ's love for them too. We help them with their physical needs, but much more importantly, we share the saving gospel with them. A few verses down in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jump down to verse 19 of the same chapter in 1 John 4. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he, has, and he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brothers. We must love our brothers. Point number two of what do we do with this love of God, point number one was we love our brothers. Point number two is because God loved us, we show our love back to God. So how do we do that? Continue on a few verses down in 1 John, look at 1 John chapter 5. How do we show our love back to God? 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 says, and everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know what, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is the love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 
We love God by, by obeying his commands. In the 16th chapter of the book of Mark, Jesus, after resurrecting from the dead, appears to his disciples, and he gives them a command. He gives them a two-part command, a command that's, uh, first of all, on their part for them to execute, and a command for the people who would hear their message. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16 says this, And he said to them, that's Jesus talking to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the command to his disciples. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's the command for the people hearing their message. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is fulfilling this command of Christ. He's preaching to the Jews that are gathered there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost teaching them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in verse 37, when the people are pricked in their hearts, they respond to the message preached by Peter, and they ask him the famous question, what shall we do? Peter's response to them is, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter shared the same command that Jesus had given him to these people. And in verse 41 of, of Acts chapter 2, we see the response of some of those people. It says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and about 3,000 souls were added to them. Peter completed his command to go and preach. The people completed their command by believing in Jesus, believing that he died for them, that his blood would save them, and by being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. The New Testament also gives other commands, commands to believe, to repent, to confess Jesus as Lord, and again to be baptized, some of those verses that we just read and, and others throughout the New Testament, in order to receive that forgiveness of sins. But it doesn't stop there. God also gives us commands to live a faithful life. Matthew chapter 24 verse 13 says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Going back to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, from one of those verses we just read a moment ago, for the love of God, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and that his commandments are not burdensome. If we love God, doing what he's asked and doing what he's commanded is not a burden. It's not a struggle. It's not a challenge in the sense that we willingly obey God. Yes, we fall, we struggle, we fail, but we continually seek him when we do that. I asked Kevin to lead that song that we sang before uh, the lesson, and we're going to sing it again afterwards because I want us to really get a better understanding, a better appreciation for how deep the Father's love for us really is. The first two verses of that song say this, how deep the Father's love for us how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out, among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. It was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. And that's a, that's a hard reality to face. But luckily for us, he does give us an opportunity, a way out, as some of the verses I just read, he gives us commandments on what we need to do to receive that remission, receive that forgiveness of sins. And in a moment, we're going to sing that invitation song, but that invitation is not my invitation at all. No, it's the Lord's invitation. If you haven't obeyed those commands that I just mentioned, uh, commands on becoming a Christian, on becoming one of his children, on being uh, part of his family where you can call him Father and share the love of the Father, where the blood of his son washes away your sins, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. Or if you are a Christian, if you've obeyed those commands to get into his family, but you haven't been living faithfully, you haven't been living obediently, 
you're also going to have an opportunity to come. So whatever your needs tonight may be, come as we stand and as we sing.